Thank you. I'll just. OK, so the recording started. Um, so my name is Neil Graffin and I am a senior lecturer in law at the Open University um, and part of part of the University of Sanctuary Working Group. And also um, I'm also working at the minute with the Council of at risk academics in terms of trying to um, get some academics at risk in the university. So today we have special guest Kai Brand Jacobson, who is regarded as one of the leading pioneers, innovators and practitioners in the field of peace, guild, peace building, security and addressing challenging and complex conflicts and crises that are in the world today. I would like to thank Kai for giving up his time today to come to speak to us, as we know he's very busy at the moment. Um, so we're very grateful for, grateful for him for taking time out of his schedule. For over 20 years, Kai has worked across all continents and many of the most challenging war zones and crisis situations at the in invitation of the United Nations, governments, international agencies and organisations, communities affected by war. He is a co-founder and president of the Peace Action Training and Research Institute of Romania and the CEO since February 25th of this year of the All for Ukraine Global Humanitarian Response and Refugee Support Group. Um, in 2019, he was awarded the Mahatma Gandhi Martin Luther King Jr. Um, at the Ziku Akita Lifetime Achievement Award for his service, service to humanity by Martin Luther King Jr.'s alma mater, Morehouse College. Drawing on his first hand experience, Kai will describe the continuing situation in Ukraine and the responses from neighbouring countries, including national and local governments, NGO, civic society, hospitals, educational institutions, and business. Um, in this session, he will consider what medium and long term stra strategic responses are necessary from host countries to support the integration of the displaced Ukrainians, what strategies will be necessary to build Ukraine and the return of its dispersed population, and the importance of access to education for forced migrants and how UK universities can provide sanctuary to students and academics. Um, be mindful that during Kai's talk, um, it, I think I should give a trigger warning. There may be distressing content and discussions of sexual violence, for example. In addition, we have Lydia Danku. Lydia works in access, participation and success in the OU um, in the Edinburgh office in Scotland on issues of widening access and participation in education for underrepresented, underrepresented and disadvantaged groups. And for the last two years has been involved in our work in forced migrations and um, specifically on our application for university University of Sanctuary status. Outside of her work at the OU, Lydia has been leading the community initi initiative MIR project, which works to support refugees from Ukraine on the territory of her native Romania. We also have Suki Hader. Suki works as, with us as a tutor and manager at the OU. She is involved in the development of inclusive curriculum and she is working, also working in partnership with students on an anti-racist education project. Suki promotes student involvement in the OU's bid to become a University of Sanctuary. And with Hazel, who's just introduced um, herself, she works with OU Student Action for Refugees Group, STAR. So thank you, and I'll pass over to Kai. Sorry, just to say that Kai um, is in. Um, 
is having some difficulties with his internet. So um, apologies, we should get up and running shortly. I'm very sorry. Can you hear me, Neil? Yep, you're coming through clearly now. Thank you. Okay, my apologies, everyone. Uh, we have been having extremely unusual difficulties across our um, our connection uh, just today. Um, and apologies because that affected my being able to hear the last bit, uh, Neil, of your introduction and and miss the handover. But I understand we're able to be diving directly into the presentation now. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So the first thing I would like to say to everyone is is thank you very much for being here today and thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I had hoped to to have a very nice PowerPoint presentation and be able to share with you um, both a great deal of information, but also pictures um, from the situation here on the ground in Romania and where I've just come from. I've just returned now from Ukraine. Uh, unfortunately, as I mentioned, we've been having both uh, extensive technical difficulties today. We're not sure why, but our network seems to be affected at the moment. Um, and uh, so will have to do with with my presenting. I will do the best that I can uh, to bring to life for us the current situation and what has been shared with us by those we've been meeting with across Ukraine. Um, we have been uh, on several uh, assessment uh, missions into Ukraine, but also uh, provision of large scale humanitarian aid. Um, we have been working since the very beginning of the war uh, to respond to the situation, as have many organizations all across the country uh, and all across Europe. So just as a, a very brief background, as was shared, uh, my name is Kai Brand Jacobson. I work as the president of the Romanian Peace Institute. And we have had a long background in the context in Ukraine, um, but we engaged more again in the months leading up to the war, initially focusing on the dynamics of the conflict and trying to support prevention uh, of an invasion and outbreak into war. And then within two hours of the invasion taking place, uh, we organized the first coming together of our humanitarian coordination team, which was set up in that moment to respond to the situation. And we have been engaging essentially 24 seven for the last six and a half weeks from that moment. Um, as many know, for people in Ukraine, up until the day of the invasion, the overwhelming majority did not believe that this was something that would happen. Um, it was just not conceivable for many that this would take place again. And people were going about their lives uh, much as they would anywhere across Europe here, here in Cluj. Uh, and then suddenly with the onslaught of the war, it has brought a, a massive and overwhelming disruption of people's lives on, on the human level. Um, and what we have seen the last six weeks, um, a continual intensification of violence and an escalation of the war, often as we've seen also over the recent weeks with direct and intentional targeting of civilian infrastructure. So for example, according to the latest report from the World Health Organization, uh, almost two thirds of all attacks on healthcare facilities, uh, three quarters of all health attack related deaths, and more than two thirds of related injuries worldwide have taken place in Ukraine over the last several weeks. Um, in the beginning, what we were seeing here on the ground in Romania, we've gone through different waves of, of people coming, of people being displaced and also of coming across the border as refugees. In the first wave, people uh, truly had no idea what was going to happen in the early days of the war. Uh, Russian forces advanced quickly. You saw large numbers of people coming over in cars, but also then uh, using the railway system in Ukraine, crossing at borders uh, all along the Romanian, Polish and other frontiers. Um, we were at the frontier with teams right from the beginning. And what you saw from the start was a lot of fear a lot of uncertainty. People didn't know what they would expect. So for example, in the very early days, we were producing information materials in Ukrainian and Russian, including videos and other materials to send in. Um, because as one example, 
there was a fear amongst many mothers and families of what they would find when they crossed the border here into Romania, uh, concerns around sexual trafficking, concerns around uh, the risks that their families or children might face. Um, on the Romanian side, the response was in, in many ways quite extraordinary. And what we referred to as that period is the phase one solidarity-based response. Everybody who could help stepped up and did. And I've been working in peace building in communities and countries affected by war for over 25 years and have been working with communities where people have been displaced internally in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Darfur, um, as well as in many contexts where you've had large scale refugee populations. But to see from a receiving country, from a hosting country, the scale of, of solidarity, of engagement, it was quite extraordinary, in some ways similar to what we saw in Lebanon with the large numbers of, of Syrian refugees that came over in Lebanon. But here, uh, every civic actor engaged. Um, civilians were bringing en masse supplies that they had to send to the front. And in that first early period, there was really a focus on supporting refugees who were crossing the border into Romania at all of the, the entry points. And you saw similar scenes in, in Poland and elsewhere. That initial period was positive in that it showed a lot of people wanting to get involved in this amazing spirit of solidarity, but it also showed challenges. Some of these challenges still remain to this day. Um, so if everyone's driving their cars up to the front to pick people up, roads are getting blocked, gasoline is being used, and it's uncoordinated. And you also have no way of guaranteeing for the safety and security of those who are being picked up. 99.9% .9 of the cases might be completely safe, but we also did have situations of trafficking early on. This was why we were sending videos into Ukraine to let people know proper procedures when they would arrive. But it's why we're also quickly on this side of the border trying to give order and structure to these processes. So we set up coordinating meetings. Some of these were being done at the national level, but we were also, for example, here in Cluj, which is the second largest city in the country, we set up a local coordination architecture. We had our first coordination meetings on the Sunday immediately after the war began, um, where we had with local authorities and over 20 civic organizations coming together to map the needs, see who was responding. And then the next day on the Monday, we had an all agency coordination meeting, more than 100 different organizations and agencies just from here in Cluj took part, including not only civic organizations, but businesses, consulates, media, schools, and many other actors. And this embodied the response, which we've really seen coming from within our own community, as well as nationally in other areas, a coming together of this constellation of actors. After the immediate, immediate first waves, in which thousands of people were crossing, and it went from 20 people an hour to 60 people an hour to then hundreds of people in the course of an hour crossing over, um, we were able to set up a good architecture along the border uh, of support where we would have volunteer teams. We set up tents to welcome people right uh, away within the first days. They would go from one tent to another, so they would receive welcome when they first arrived, people to greet them. Um, we've quickly worked to get Ukrainian and Russian speaking teams at the front as well. They would then be taken to a tent where they could register and, and uh, be informed about what the situation was, what their needs were. Uh, there are food tents at the front to be able to provide for people. And then uh, there would also, for example, be tents for parents with children if they needed a special area. Early on, we saw that uh, people were uncertain about their approaches to the authorities or those they were speaking with. And you had initiatives, which some of you may have seen the pictures of, where our local border authorities, the actual frontier police, began putting out toys for children all along the, the, the bridges that people would be entering in. And you could see this incredible response, this, this shift from in the early period where people had been very uh, trepidatious, very concerned about what they would be met with, to with these bridges covered in balloons and toys and their children's picking them up because due to the uh, military ordinance in Ukraine, the overwhelming majority, as we know, of people coming over have been families or women and children. Um, men are able to cross if they either have medical permit to be allowed out or if they have three children within a certain age and under 18, um, but otherwise are not legally allowed to leave. Um, so the overwhelming majority of the population were families, parents with uh, mothers with children, um, 
um, or very young and very old. And the receiving a gift, the, the, the change it made for the children also helped to create trust from the adults uh, and, and just a, a change you could see in their demeanor and their attitude. But people were coming with tremendous fear of what they were leaving behind and tremendous uncertainty of what they were coming to. Um, at the Romanian border, as many, within days, people were being allowed to cross without needing necessarily the normal papers that they would have to because it was considered to be an emergency situation. Um, you saw in the early phase, probably in the realm of about 90% of people were moving on further uh, into Western Europe and elsewhere. So you've had millions of people from Ukraine working abroad over many years, as much of the population across uh, Eastern Europe more widely. So those who had people they could go to in Spain, in Germany, in France, would transit through Poland and Romania, but would quickly move on further. What I would like to do, knowing that we don't have that much time for the, the introductory comments altogether, is I want to structure it a little bit. I want to share with you just a bit about the response that we've been providing within Romania, then speak about one of the critical areas of need, the internally displaced in Ukraine, and then share a few words about some of the priority issues we're addressing, including psychosocial support for trauma work, and then be able to open up for questions and interaction. So in brief, Within Romania, I have to say it's one of the most extraordinary responses I've, I've ever seen anywhere in my life. Um, from the very beginning, for example, we had schools opening their doors to let in Ukrainian students and a real focus on minimizing the, the shock, the difference for children so that uh, it would minimize the impact on them. In addition to children being welcomed into schools, you also had daycare and play centers set up for children to give breathing space for parents so that, uh, especially in this case, because it was overwhelmingly mothers, so that they could be able to take care of things, have a moment to breathe, have a moment to grieve. Um, but very quickly in Romania, we're also setting up all Ukrainian schools, hiring Ukrainians to teach in them and teaching according to the Ukrainian curriculum. You also saw responses, for example, from psychologists wanting to offer support. And in this first phase, it was Romanian psychologists volunteering. But obviously, there's a language barrier, so it wasn't fitting the needs. In Ukraine, people are still not very used to speaking to psychologists, as in many countries, Romania as well. Um, so there's both the cultural blocker to it, uh, but also it's not that easy if you're speaking to someone who doesn't speak your language. So what we've quickly moved to are supporting Ukrainian psychologists abroad. We're starting now first in Romania, but then we're going to try to partner in other areas or work with partners in other countries for them to set up similar systems where we're creating centers where Ukrainians can go and uh, where Ukrainian psychologists are now being hired, which both helps to provide employment to the Ukrainian psychologists. It helps them to uh, be part of the effort of supporting their country. And and it also helps to make sure that those in need are receiving the support they need. We have also had um, solidarity events throughout this period. So thinking of the cultural side of it, thinking of making people from Ukraine feel that they were supported, and it's been beautiful. These have been held every Saturday. Larger and larger numbers have been coming. Uh, we've had the mayor and city officials. We've had families, school children, organizations come out, and it's a space for people to come together. Very early on, they also set up support for families. So, for example, um, the international community and Romanians here in Cluj uh, have created spaces where uh, parents, families from Ukraine can come, they speak with them, they understand their needs, they work to support them. So what you're seeing is what we have referred to as a human-based response and a care-based response. And it's included everything from setting up at um, the borders to bring people in and help them on that transport, setting up at railway stations where many are coming into the country, but also really listening to the people from Ukraine. And as many know, um, there have been extraordinary legal measures taken. So for example, on, on March 7th, the Romanian parliament took the step to grant extensive rights to Ukrainians in uh, Romania based upon their Ukrainian citizenship. So without even needing to apply as refugees. And this has created an unusual situation because it means that while there are millions of Ukrainians who have left the country, over 4 million now and are abroad elsewhere, in Europe, 
the overwhelming majority have not yet registered as refugees. So they are refugees according to the traditional sense, but we're not hosting them in refugee camps. People are putting them up in apartments. You're having hotels which are being transformed uh, or dormitories of universities since many are still doing um, online learning from COVID. Um, and you're having people integrated into the community. We organized very early on with partners a meeting with 100 businesses to look at procedures for hiring Ukrainian. So there's really been an extraordinary solidarity based response and a human based approach um, to supporting people in need. And we even try as often as possible. We do not use the word refugee in any context, but we are welcoming uh, our neighbors and people of our community from Ukraine here. I'd be glad to speak more about that, but I'd like to shift to an area which did not receive as much attention internationally in the beginning. Now it's beginning to shift to it, um, but that is the unbelievable need in the country, the overwhelming need in the country. Um, so about 4 million people from Ukraine, including international citizens in Ukraine, people from um, India, from Nigeria, from many different countries. Uh, and we can speak more about this because one issue we had to deal with in the beginning is to make sure on the Ukrainian side and on the Polish and Romanian and other sides that people would be welcomed regardless of ethnicity, gender, or any various distinction but welcomed and received at, in humanitarian need, blind to distinction. But that was an issue we had to work on a lot. But far larger than the number of people displaced outside Ukraine have been the number of people displaced inside Ukraine. Official estimates are now over 7 million people. These are primarily people coming from the most war affected areas of the country, which have been directly um, occupied or attacked by uh, Russian armed forces and moving to other areas inside Ukraine. But here are some of the differences. One, not all of these areas are safe. Some of them are still under attack. Some of them are definitely um, even when safer, you're hearing sirens and other things going off, which bring a very real reminder of the war to you. Even in areas which are not on the front lines of the war, uh, inside Ukraine, provision and supply lines have definitely been affected by the war. So if someone comes over to a city in Poland or Romania or goes on further to Western Europe, they're in the European Union. They're in an area where you have full supply lines for the supermarkets, where you have safety and security. Um, when you're inside Ukraine, people are displaced. They bring an additional challenge into the areas they move into um, because they can uh, stress the supply, the resources within those areas. For example, in some areas, supermarkets quickly became empty. That means it's not only the at-risk population of the displaced who went into the country, but uh, or went into the city, but those from that area originally now also have the empty supermarkets uh, and, and empty shelves in the stores. So you actually grow the population at risk. Inside Ukraine, it is, I, I don't think it is possible to overstate the way in which people at every level of the society are responding and engaging. We met with all levels of government. We met with hospitals and medical workers across the country, humanitarian coordinators, psychologists, women's organizations, youth organizations, um, people of so many different backgrounds. And people are engaging massively in the solidarity and humanitarian response. So you have um, centers that have been set up in almost every major area for uh, the humanitarian coordination. You have hospitals both right on the front lines and uh, in all major hospitals in the country that are receiving war wounded and those in need. Um, because the number of displaced has dramatically exceeded anything that, that a coordinated state response could provide for, um, you've had restaurants, and, and I'm sorry, I, I will try and send you after the presentation that we're putting together because I'm not being able to share it at the moment, but um, you had hospitals, uh, schools, um, orphanages, all turned into reception areas. Now, where, where people have been hosting um, people who've been displaced in the country. And these are areas in incredible need. In the early days, we were receiving emergency requests from tiny shelters, which might be an orphanage or just a larger apartment that suddenly has 40 or 50 people in it. Um, and they needed food, they needed mattresses, they needed fresh fruits and vegetables sometimes, but uh, or, or socks, because in the early days, it was very cold uh, when the war broke out and some people left with 
without even having proper supplies. Um, and what we were doing was within the the within seven days of the start of the war, in addition to providing for those on the border and those here, we were sending shipments into Ukraine. Now we're in phase two. I spoke of phase one, the solidarity based response. Phase two has really been about giving more structure, more organization to it, trying to improve coordination amongst the different agencies involved and would be very glad to speak to that because there are some positive things and there are some things which it is incredible now over six weeks in to see that coordination is not being done better at many levels as well. And there's definitely a need to improve. Um, but in this second phase, what we're trying to do is for over the last weeks map out all of the, the trusted institutions in the country um, because there is also smuggling and black market. So even when you're providing to a hospital, you need to make sure you're providing to the right people in the hospital and it will get used. Um, trusted partners in terms of humanitarian actors, but also uh, within communities, those who are in shelters so that we know that the people are getting helped. And our aim is to get what is needed where it is needed to the people who need it. Um, and that requires a, a massive effort. So we both send in large scale shipments of, of um, you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 tons of food and medicines uh, to larger areas and to the humanitarian centers. But we also have convoys of small vehicles that are going to small villages or to small towns um, where they need immediate support uh, in an area. Um, so to a specific orphanage or to a specific school. So I can speak much more about the, the situation internally, but right now you have about 7 million people who have been displaced inside the country. Many of them have moved um, to the center and the west of the country. What we have seen in the last days is again a significant increase. So about 10 days ago, the numbers coming across borders or the numbers of people being displaced inside the country, it was not increasing that significantly. But now, as Russian forces have repositioned and as they've again uh, increased uh, attacks on the, the east and the south, and also with recent attacks, particularly on the train station and civilian areas, um, we're seeing a dramatic increase in the number of people being displaced again. And on our side, as one of the organizations in involved in response, we have seen a, a spike in the last days of requests coming from hospitals for emergency supplies and from shelters and, and aid for where people are displaced. Now, again, knowing we only have a bit of time left, what I would like to speak to additionally are some critical areas. One is addressing trauma. And I mentioned the work that we're doing with working with psychologists outside the country. Um, there is a huge need to be working with psychologists inside the country. There's a wonderful organization that was put together after 2014 uh, invasions in Maidan um, called the Crisis, uh, the Trauma Crisis Response Network inside Ukraine. These are Ukrainian psychologists that we're working with. They've gained years of experience working with survivors of, of war and displacement. Um, and right now though, for example, they've identified five hot areas with the largest number of IDPs in the country. Um, they don't even have basic things like office space to work from because in some cases their office spaces have been destroyed. So we're working to fund them, to provide them with the support that they need to hire psychologists inside the country. Um, to be working and we're focusing on both those who are affected and in need of support overall but also very specific groups um, youth who are being affected um, survivors of rape and and sexual violence which has been happening increasingly in areas occupied by the russian forces um, people who have lost loved ones and another group at risk which has come out from discussions um, there's a lot of shame that has been felt or different emotions for mothers who have left with their children to safety either inside the country or outside the country and the fact that their husbands are still at the front line and often forced at the front line um, and that has created many 
difficulties psychologically for people in that situation, in addition to just the exhaustion and the stress that they're under. Um, and I can share with you, uh, the night I returned from, from Ukraine, uh, I was woken by our police locally and I was assisting them for two and a half hours searching because a young Ukrainian woman, um, they had pinged her phone to the area, but they couldn't find her. She'd given the wrong address, but she called them in panic saying that she need, she was going to commit suicide because she couldn't take it anymore. Um, the, the burden and what people are facing at many levels is, is tragic. And we're trying to help support, and, and it's first and foremost the Ukrainians who are leading and doing all these efforts. What we're trying to do is help them to get to, to get to them the support so that they can do that. The other category that we're looking at with dealing with trauma are soldiers. And I can just share with you very quickly uh, an amazing uh, counselor and therapist that we met with in Kyiv just a few days ago told us the story of her father who had been an Afghanistan, a Soviet soldier in Afghanistan, and the impact that had, uh, he was never able to really speak about it. It affected his life. It affected their family on many levels. And then she has lived her life. And the day we met, she had just seen a picture of her son now at the front line. So affecting now a whole other generation. In addition to working with psychologists, we have a huge program where we're focusing on working with youth and youth centers across Ukraine, helping them to deal with the impact of the war, helping them uh, also dealing with uh, training them to do therapy first aid. And then we're going to have a program with schools um, nationwide across the country because you need a school based approach if you really want to reach all of the children who've been affected. Um, we're also working with human rights organizations and others that are tracking uh, the the attacks, attacks on civilians and also sexual and gender based violence and working to set up a system for protecting survivors. Um, and there is there's a lot more we could speak to. I, I have to apologize. These days have been overwhelming. Uh, we've been working at the front line for six weeks straight. I've had one day and a half off in total uh, in terms of weekends or anything in, in that entire period. But then on top of it, my son went into the emergency in the hospital this weekend and I've spent the last days in the hospital. So that uh, affected. I hope I've been able to give you at least some sense of the situation and where it is. Um, we have an incredible team of people who've been responding from day one to this situation, but also what really there are not words to describe um, is, is to appreciate, to recognize, to honor the response given by the people from Ukraine themselves, both those who have come uh, to Romania and other countries for safety. The moment they arrive, many are asking, how can we help? How can we get involved? And our team here at the All for Ukraine Global Humanitarian Response is overwhelmingly people from Ukraine who've themselves stepped up, but also inside Ukraine, people are doing everything they can. Uh, I'd like to, to stop there and just to open up so we can have a conversation and go into more specifics and more details if there's any issues that you would like to speak about and that I can help on and thank you for your attention so far. Um, Kai, I would just like to reiterate, we really appreciate the time that you've taken um, today um, to come to speak to us and thank you again for that um, sadly very harrowing talk you gave, um, but also um, to talk to us about the work that you've been doing to support those affected um, by, by the invasion of Ukraine. Um, now, prior to audience questions, we wanted to do a bit of a QA, and a um, and then I think we'll give everybody um, hopefully a bit of a chance to ask a few questions um, of Kai afterwards. So I'm just going to pass on to my colleague Lydia. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, and thank you, Kai, for that. Um, just a couple of questions that have uh, arisen with us um, whilst we were preparing for this um, event. Um, and you mentioned uh, the phase one and phase two responses, um, but looking towards the future a little bit and to towards a long term response, what do you think are the strategic responses necessary? Um, on one hand, to integrate those who have fled into their host uh, communities and their host societies, and on the other hand, to help those dispersed populations who are trying to return to Ukraine to mm. resettle and rebuild. Thank you so much, Lydia. Um, so the first thing I would say is part of what we're constantly saying to the UN and to international agencies is, can we please finally, actually we're not saying can, we were saying we need to 
learn the lessons from the last 50 years of, of supporting displaced communities and refugees around the world and, and international humanitarian response. So what we are putting into practice ourselves and trying every way we can to encourage everyone to is a respect based a human centered and a listening approach. So when we're trying to understand what can be put in place on a, a systematic and structural level for long term response, we really need to be working to listen to Ukrainian communities and those who are displaced. And this should be true in every situation of, of refugee and displaced populations to understand where they are and what their needs are and to take an agency based approach to involve them from their own capacity to be responding to and addressing what they're facing. Um, we need to have much better integrated joined up needs assessment. So we need actors working together at every single level. The reality is, for example, in Romania, the response has been amazing, but it's only been amazing because all of us at civil society have given 10,000% of effort. We've gone days and nights without sleeping. We've worked through, people have left their jobs to be responding to the humanitarian need. Um, but in Romania, we did not have an architecture, a system set up at the national level, either of government or of NGOs for dealing with a war situation or humanitarian response. So right now, uh, I usually train UN systems and others internationally when I'm working around the world on how to improve coordination, but you have only international agencies meeting as sometimes happen happens. You have calls from one of the uh, humanitarian coordination capacities of the government uh, on dealing with the situation and they're meeting with NGOs, but the other ministries aren't involved. So what we really need to do is a joined up mapping of short, medium and long term and looking at needs on different lines, um, employment and, and well-being or also integrating cash transfers into that. We need to look at educational needs of youth. We need to look at how to support culturally the community, psychosocial support, deal with people who are victims of war, other areas. Um, um, but this should be part of an integrated plan, a joined up needs assessment, not every agency doing their own separate needs assessment, as they often do. In the first weeks of the war, because of our work internationally and our trainings, we had 20 different international agencies calling us asking, could we help them with their needs assessments? And we were very glad to. But what we would prefer is instead of 20 different needs assessments, doing it integrated. Because um, if you do it 20 different times and everyone wants to speak to a local mayor in Siget, then the local mayor in Siget at the frontier doesn't have the time to do his work and to help. So we need a lot better, smarter approach from international agencies. We need to begin mapping which institutions within countries, such as Romania, Poland, and others right at the frontiers, um, will be needed to address different needs. So social services, educational services. We've spoken with those in our local government level here. They will be willing to respond, but they haven't received directive yet. What we would like is to see a strategic forecast based approach, looking at what are the needs over the coming six to 12 months so that we are preparing and our capacity would exceed the need. We want to be over prepared rather than under prepared. We're not there yet. That's one of the things in, uh, for, for inside countries like Romania. So for, for those who've been displaced abroad in terms of for inside the country and for return, you're already seeing people wanting to return. So we're having people now in going in two directions. Some people are continuing to come across the border to Romania. Some people, because it's slightly safer in Kiev region now and in a few others. They're trying to go back now in a city like Kiev that will not be difficult potentially as, as long as the tide of war doesn't change and Russia doesn't use, you know, further bombing or other things. The city is actually fairly safe, as are many which have not been in the direct area of attack, but so because of that, infrastructure is not destroyed. Schools are there. Apartments are there. People will be able to uh, begin going back uh, back to it. But you have, I think the latest estimate is approximately $700 billion of destroyed infrastructure in war. Um, what we really need is to begin planning for essentially a major large scale Marshall Plan for Europe. And the European Commission and others are already speaking about it. But here's where I'd bring one of our biggest warnings for everyone who has any international experience. On average, the uh, level of states meeting their pledged commitment to rebuilding countries, they usually uh, meet 8% of what they've pledged, of what they've committed. So there's a huge gap between the words when the camera is there 
and then the actual follow through. What we're now working with, we're very fortunate. We have uh, uh, our mayor in, in our city, Cluj. He's the former prime minister of the country, and he's about to become the head of one of the largest uh, European Union platforms of regions and cities. And they're looking at city to city cooperation. So we need to start city to city cooperation. We need to create a plan for long term development, but we need to get you and myself, citizens, academia, people at every level involved so that there will be the political commitment to really deliver on those pledges to rebuild in Ukraine. Thank you very much for that, Kai. And um, I'm glad you mentioned academia because um, I have one more question in relation to that before I hand over to my colleague Suki, who will pick um, questions up from the audience. Um, in terms of education, what do you think is the role of education and what, what responsibility does the education sector in general and the tertiary education sector in, in particular, because we are a university, uh, both in the UK as well as in the rest of the world, what, what responsibility do we have to support students and staff um, to continue studying and to continue value and their valuable work in general? I'd like to address that question on two levels because I believe we have the responsibility as academia that we need to begin to understand and take on. And I'm going to speak to this from the experience of having spent 25 years working in war zones since I was 17 years old. The, the first thing we need to do is begin to start actually educating for peace. Uh, that, that's first and foremost because these wars would not be happening if we were promoting proper peace education at every level of our school systems and educating people how to address conflicts effectively, training professional peace services rather than just spending over $2 trillion a year for the advancement uh, of war, which is what's happening. So one, there's that responsibility for all of us as citizens and as academia. Two, I believe there's a tremendous responsibility and opportunity we can have to play a positive role uh, from universities and from schools in Europe. One, um, to, for example, bring on Ukrainian educators who've been displaced or partner with Ukrainian universities to be able to ed offer programs in Ukrainian for Ukrainian students so they can continue with their learning. So one, it's not just about bringing in isolated people to each of our universities, but let's set up a coordinated response as European universities to help support Ukrainian universities and maybe do something like adopt a student, adopt a university, so we can also look at raising funds for them to help them because they are in desperate need in this period. Also, there is tremendous opportunity for us to open our classes. Many Ukrainian students do speak two, three, four or more languages. Um, so providing academic uh, asylum, bringing people in as students and investing in the incredible human resources that will be needed to rebuild this country going further. So I would suggest on that level as well. Third, creating academic spaces where we can look at how to deal with healing and trauma and preventing the hate that can rise up that we are already seeing, especially with the recent atrocities, but also preventing the further rise of extremism across Europe. Um, I believe as academics and universities, we need to be very conscious of this and engage collaboratively, as well as reaching out to Russian academics and others to encourage their resistance and opposition to the war. Thank you very much for that, Kai. I'm just going to pass on to my colleague Suki, who's going to pick up some uh, questions from the audience. Over to you, Suki. Thanks, Lydia. Thanks, Kai. So related to the last answer that you gave, Ian Ulua has asked a really interesting question about um, non-Ukrainian nationals, and, and you're talking about the far right. So we saw on the news, didn't we, the, the racism that were faced for students from Africa and students from India. What has happened? to them and in particular what's happening to people who are fleeing that haven't got the relevant legal documents that can't claim right to remain so um first thing i would say is that uh the overwhelming majority okay 99 out of every 100 cases of international citizens citizens from around the world who are living in ukraine for a wide variety of reasons some of them working there some of them as students some of them as as long -term Term residents of many decades um, experienced total solidarity from the people of Ukraine when leaving. I know because we've helped many come across. We've had a focus on this since the Saturday, the second day 
after the war began, um, and out of many hundreds who've come across Romania, uh, from Ukraine to Romania, from India, from uh, Bolivia, from uh, Iran, from Nigeria, uh, from Sri Lanka, from many different countries, they've spoken of the total solidarity and support that they received every step along the way. There were incidents early on, on two levels. Um, Incidents we saw reported from the Polish border with Ukrainian um, border guards at the, the Polish side and a few others. Now, one thing, I we would have to question to what extent these incidents were also um, escalated in their reporting by actors who had an interest in discrediting them um, and to what extent it was really there. What we've done from the very first moment is uh, we contacted Ukrainian authorities, both at the level of border police and national government, and called for the um, equal treatment of all and also emphasized how vitally important this was for Ukraine to show their fair treatment and solidarity with all people affected by the war, also for Ukraine's image and, and perception internationally, and first and foremost, because it is the right thing to do. Um, but we have seen that primarily people have not faced that. Where there has been some challenge, um, and this I can only say again, it's been reported by, is um, in countries like Poland and Hungary, where there's been a much more unfortunate rise of extremism and, and uh, racism and discrimination over recent years, um, we have had reports uh, from some people we've been in contact with, primarily students from Africa, that they have faced both really solidarity-based response from civil society, but not always the same overall. Um, here in Romania, when someone crosses, uh, even if they don't have papers, if they're coming from Ukraine, that's not a problem. They're, they're allowed across. But for example, now we have a situation we were just contacted on this morning of a Nigerian student who doesn't have his passport because he was in at the authorities in Ukraine when the war began and he didn't get it back. Um, now, here in Romania, everything is fine for him for the moment, but if he wants to travel on further, he needs to get his passport again. So in these cases, we're contacting the embassies of African countries. I also know that there's been some amazing work, a number of, of African ambassadors who've really been working to support uh, their students and others coming across. But I would say um, overwhelmingly, people have been treated equally. In every case where there is injustice or unequal treatment, we're working to to address that and report that. I have not seen a single one since the fourth or fifth day of the war where we were seeing them reported. At least on this side, it's not as much there. But again, we do know from colleagues that there are situations of concern in Poland and Hungary, usually with great reception by the civil society. But in the broader society, there are challenging issues of racism. The other community who's been very affected and at times faced discrimination is the LGBTQI plus uh, community. Uh, and there, from the beginning, we've been providing to LGBTQI shelters in Romania, sorry, in Ukraine, but also to see, and I can only speak about the situation here, but the way that the LGBTQI uh, plus community and broader civil society and authorities have responded has really been to ensure that everyone is available to come in, able to come into Romania and receives the same treatment regardless of distinction. The last community who really does face risk are military age men in Ukraine. Um, and we have had situations where uh, some who don't want to fight for whatever reason, it's it's not what they have chosen to do. And also there are many women who have chosen to fight. So it's not uh, just that way, but for men who don't want to, some of them have been crossing the rivers to get across. And we've had at least three young men who've died. Um, one of them uh, froze to death uh, and died trying to cross uh, the river. So that is also a human rights issue um, that, that we believe should be taken up as well. Thanks. So, so there's so much, isn't there? There are so many angles that need to be looked at. And and you you're one organisation and and you're working with other other organisations. Do you have direct access to government departments? And was asking about ambassadors. Yes, so we do have access to ambassadors. We do have access to government departments. Uh, I should say we're not one organization. We are as Patrier, but as the All for Ukraine uh, Global Humanitarian Response, there's about 40 organizations working here from um, people providing medical support, psychologists, educational uh, schools and educational bodies, the Cluj International Women's Club, so many different. And what's amazing, uh, my colleagues are, are getting used to it. I don't know if it's just from 
exhaustion and the wear of all, but they're they're used to seeing every day at one at many points my eyes are just tearing up. And it's because people are just saying, How can we help? Every time we're faced, people with anything, people say, How can we help? And there's this amazing solidarity. So we're we're more than one. We do have access to to embassies, but I would say the situation that we're facing and, and to government is that the coordination structures in place are not at the level of what is needed in really robust humanitarian coordination. There needs to be improvement there. We've actually been implementing coordination meetings at a local level here in Cluj with great response and engagement from actors. And there it's going, I would say, impressively well. But more needs to be done at the national and the international level to improve it. We do also have very good contacts with ambassadors, but it's a matter of time. So just to give you an idea, you can see one whiteboard filled with me on the other side of this wall. There's tons of them. Every one is for a humanitarian response that we're trying to address. Um, we yesterday received requests for over 1 million euros in humanitarian aid. That is well beyond what is our scope in terms of just emergency supplies of getting in foods and medicines. We're also working to, apply, to supply 17 hospitals uh, at the front. And even though you're seeing, you know, these giant responses from the Red Cross and the UN and others, and that should all be supported and we definitely need more of that. The reality is there's a gap. There's a huge gap between the needs. And, and for example, when there was the attack on the train station just this last week, um, we were able, um, we had uh, medical supplies that were going in and we redirected them immediately to Kramatorsk, to where the, the railway station was, um, to get those critical supplies to the doctors in the hospitals responding. So um, our focus is there uh, and and um, we're working all out on it. A lot more could be done if we had more time and opportunity to also be improving on the coordination and that would definitely be improving the humanitarian response and the refugee support overall. And and comments in the chat are coming about your positive energy and the great work you're doing and, and the audience is sending you love and support and wishing you well and wishing your son well. Can I ask about, you know, your role? Because that connects with other comments about education. So so you're a peace builder and and so what you want to do is emphasize how as a society we spend all this money on advancing war and nothing like the amount of energy and money is spent on peace building and conflict resolution and avoiding war. Can you talk about that for a bit and how as educators, you know, we can help shift this balance towards peace? So the first thing I would like to do is to say thank you for for your beautiful messages uh, that people are writing and thank you for your uh, your kindness and your caring my son is now well and he is fortunately back at home um, but for anyone who is a parent or has someone you love closely you know how that feels and uh, when there's a situation beyond your control and that's how many people in ukraine feel now and what I would actually love to share with you is pictures from what happened this saturday where we had a ukraine fair and I think this is part of what should be our response as well. We're very aware of the need to keep up people's morale and keep up people's support. And we also care about how our, our families, our friends, our community from Ukraine feel. And so what we did this weekend at their request was we organized a Ukraine fair where they brought their food, their music, their culture, their themselves. And... It was powerful. It was painful. We played songs written in the last week after the massacres discussed, were, were discovered. People cried and had tears streaming down their faces and held each other. But thousands of people came. Um, the people in Ukraine weren't being recipients of aid. They were being seen for their culture and they were being loved and welcomed and celebrated. And that's part of peace building and that's part of the response. Um, Suki, on the question uh, in terms of as someone who's worked in peace building for 25 years, um, I would also like to share with you that together with the All for Ukraine humanitarian response, we have a platform called All for Peace. And this is bringing together people working in nonviolence, people working in peace building, and we're working to support at the level of talks to try and uh, bring progress there. But we are particularly focusing on supporting 
uh, civil resistance and nonviolent resistance in Ukraine, nonviolent resistance to the invasion and to the occupation forces. And I wish we had hours more to be able to tell you the stories of the courage of people in Ukraine. The man who stood in front of the Russian tank coming into his village without arms and blocked it. The people who go to the Russian soldiers to speak to them, because many of them were told they were going there to prevent a genocide or prevent a NATO invasion. Russian soldiers have been lied to as well. So we're working to support inside Ukraine nonviolent resistance. We're working to support in Russia and Belarus opposition to the war. And we are calling upon academics. Contact your colleagues and academics in Russia and Belarus. Listen to them first, but engage with them and build opposition to the war. If you're in student organizations, there are student organizations in Russia and all over the world as well. Let's use these. Let's reach out to students in Russia and get them to stand up and oppose the war. If you're part of art, cultural, music associations, business associations, let us use every channel we have. Issues of ending war and building peace are too important to leave in the hands of generals and politicians alone. We need to realize how dangerous this moment is, how dangerous the moment of the last 30 years. We've allowed the fanaticism, the extremism of war from September 11th to America's invasion of Iraq, America's invasion of Afghanistan, the brutal and horrific ongoing war in Yemen, the destruction of Syria. We have abolished formally slavery as a system worldwide. There's still 40 million people in slavery around the world today, but we've abolished the formal system of slavery. We have overcome by and large cannibalism. We have overcome many of these systemic human catastrophes. And there are few human catastrophes as incompetent, as obscene, as absurd as war. And we spend $2 trillion for the investment in the fanaticism of war today. As a species, we have never had the imagination, the creativity, the scientific, cultural, technological capacity and freedom and innovation that we have in the world today. And I have a presentation that I've given in parliaments, that I've given in schools, that I've given in so many different settings, and I show the incredible things that we innovate as a species. And, and people say that they have goosebumps at the end of it. You can see the way people are involved. And then I show just a few of the major systemic crises we face in the world today, such as the organized systematic destruction of the environment based upon our economic and political choices, such as our global economic inequality, where a few men have more wealth than 4.5 billion people put together, such as the fanaticism and incompetence of our war system, where war is simply unable to actually address and solve conflicts and to address and solve the problems it gives rise to. And then I ask people, when you look at the leadership we have in the world today and our governments, are you filled with the profound confidence and knowledge that we are bringing the best of our human ability as a species to solve these problems? And we're not, but we can. The challenge is there and it is up to us to address it. Um, on that note, I think that it's a wonderful way to, to end that discussion, Kai. And um, I probably felt like some of your students with goosebumps at the end there, um, just, just listening to you. Um, I think um, we could listen to you for a lot longer, but sadly, we're going to have to wrap up. Um, I just want to thank you again for taking your time today um, to hear that deeply humbling but hugely enlightening session and I, I hope it really gives us all um, thought as what we can do as a global community to um, to help um, the, the very helpful term that you use there to help our neighbours which is effectively what this is about. Um, again I just want to reiterate I hope again your, your son gets um, recovers well and I'm glad to hear that you said that he, he's doing well. Um, just a few things at the end, really. Um, if you want to support Kai's work, um, there, there is a fundraiser. Uh, you can click on the link, and it will that, that fundraiser directly supports um, supports the work there. That's through the Mir project. So you can click on that link, and it'll bring bring it open on the browser. Um, we as a university, um, through the Sanctuary Group, will be um, doing further seminars, um, and. Um, <clears throat> This is actually the first in a series of seminars which are aimed at raising awareness of the very different circumstances in which people displaced by war, asylum seekers, refugees, and others seeking humanitarian protection 
um, sorry, we're raising awareness of the very different circumstances in which um, in which those um, groups of people um, are in and how we as the OU can cultivate a culture of welcome of support. Um, so we will be we will be conducting an, another seminar um, soon in relation to that. And we are also trying to get University of Sanctuary status at the moment, and we are hoping that that's something that we sh can be able to achieve. But we are in the um, we're in the midst of, of of trying to do that um just this present moment of time. So we do also welcome your feedback for this seminar and um, said provide us with feedback for a chance of winning hundred pound in donations towards the above fundraiser. And I'd just like to thank you for all your time today as well. It was um wonderful to have such a large group here today and to hear such a, a fantastic talk. So thank you again. Thank you, Kai. Thank you so much, uh, Neil, Lydia, Suki, and thank you everyone who's been here. And uh, as I wrote in the message, you have my contact details. And if you wish to help by doing what Lydia has done and others and creating a group in your community to help raise support, or if you want to come here to Cluj, I've been to 126 countries around the world. I have fallen in love with Cluj. It's a wonderful town. We have a, a space here. Everyone can get involved, can support. Um, there's so much we can do and it is needed. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. Mutsumeshi kusunum. Jakuyu.